Good morning, everybody. I'm Lindsay Reiser. And I'm Zinclair Samoa. Joe and Savannah are off this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, secession battle with UK Prime Minister Liz Truss out of office after just six weeks. The UK's top job is open once again. We're taking a look at the mess left behind in Britain's parliament after the shortest lasting PM in the country's history. Plus, whether former Prime Minister Boris Johnson could stage the comeback of all comebacks and return to 10 Downing Street. Eyes on the peach state. Voters in Georgia are already casting their ballots in the state's critical midterm races. The final push as the latest polling shows both races neck and neck. Also this morning, sounding the alarm. Hospitals are seeing more cases of respiratory illness in children. What doctors want parents to know about that rise. Plus, is there life out there? Recent videos show what appears to be unidentified aerial phenomena flying over the U.S. and off its coastline. What experts are saying about these potentially out of this world images? I can never get enough of those videos. I was going to say, uh, do you believe in you know life? Oh, sure. There? How yeah. lonely would we be? <laughs> this is true. This we'll is go with true. That. But we're going to start on Earth here in the UK and the political chaos facing the government there following the resignation of Prime Minister Liz Truss. Truss stepped down yesterday after a disastrous few weeks of financial turmoil and cabinet resignations. By the way, just 45 days into her tenure. The race to succeed Truss as leader of the Conservative Party and become prime minister is already underway. Truss's former leadership rival, Rishi Sunak, is among the favorites. But speculation is mounting over the possible return of Truss's predecessor, Boris Johnson. The winner could be announced as early as Monday or at the latest next Friday. That's right. And joining us now to talk more on this is Dr. Leslie Vinjamuri. She's the director of the U.S. and the Americas program and dean of the Queen Elizabeth II Academy for Leadership and International Affairs at Chatham House. Doctor, thank you so much for being with us this morning. So to jump in, Britain's Conservative Party is facing a second leadership contest in only just a few months, as we just heard. Some of the potential hopefuls actually include Boris Johnson, who stood down himself after a series of scandals. So just simply real talk does he actually have a chance and how unprecedented of a move would a, would that be it would be very unusual he certainly has a chance i think that uh, many people are hoping that that chance is quite small boris johnson will be working very hard to see if he can get the 100 <clears throat> votes of support that he needs from his fellow mps in order to make that cut that's a very high bar I think if he did come back, it would prove to be tremendously divisive. This is certainly uh, Boris Johnson, the most divisive candidate uh, possible when it comes to the party and then the MPs who sit uh, in the House of Commons. Um, it's not impossible. I don't think he's favored right now, but he will be working very hard um, over the weekend to try and shore up support. And, Doctor, the opposition parties in the U.K. have been calling for a general election. And we want to show you right now a recent poll. Conservatives have been plummeting. This recent one by People Polling shows them as low as 14 percent. So is the party at risk of appearing undemocratic by, again, choosing the next leader among their own? I think this is a real concern. You know, what, and the, the broader question is, will the next prime minister um, who's going to be chosen potentially only by the members of parliament. Remember, if only one candidate uh, manages to get those 100 uh, votes of support from his or her own MPs, that person will become prime minister on Monday. If there are two, it will go to a, a vote by the members of the Conservative Party. That's still a tiny number. Remember that uh, the prime minister, Liz Truss, who is stepping down soon, only won with 81,000 votes. So there is a real question about, you know, whether the next prime minister will be seen to be legitimate. This is the way that prime ministers are chosen in the UK. They're chosen by the party and people vote for their members of parliament, their local members of parliament to, to turn up in London. Uh, but when you have this kind of turn turnover, uh, this level of chaos, it raises a broader question, a constitutional question mm. about those rules, no, no matter how long standing they are. And Dr. Vijamuri, I wonder, beyond the UK, is this prolonged political instability damaging the UK's standing on the world stage? How is it impacting relations with allies like in Europe and the US? 
Well, we've seen uh, the, the leader of France, Macron, calling on the UK to, to generate more political stability. The European Union wants this. Um, everybody is watching Britain. I think we all know that it's sort of become the joke of the day, what's happening in the UK. Um, it's tremendously damaging here in the UK financially. People are deeply worried, first and foremost, about the impact on their daily lives, on the financial health, the economic health of the country. Um, at a time when we know the foreign policy issues are very significant, the UK should be and has been a leader um, when it comes to the response to the war in Ukraine, to questions of China. But all of those things right now are, you know, at, they're on hold until there is until we get through this period. So it's potentially tremendously damaging, certainly in the short term. And it really comes down to whether or not the party could choose a leader swiftly who can really uh, begin to bring the country back together and really tackle that very significant economic crisis that is that is looming large. For sure, a lot to watch out for. Dr. Leslie Vinjamuri, thank you so much. Switching gears to politics here in the U.S. The midterm elections are now just a little more than two weeks away, but already millions of Americans have cast their ballots in more than a dozen states. Tomorrow, early voting gets underway in both Massachusetts and Nevada, with more states to follow next week. And in Georgia, where early voting began this week, more than half a million voters have already cast their ballots in person. There are plenty of races we're watching as we get closer to the election, including for the Georgia Senate seat that could potentially decide which party controls Congress. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joins us now from Atlanta with the latest on that race. Ellison, good morning. Good to see you. You've been watching this one really closely. And Democrat Senate candidate, uh, current Senator Raphael Warnock and Republican challenger Herschel Walker are pretty much neck and neck. Just a few more days to go. We know that the Warnock campaign has released some new ads. What are those about? Yeah, so it's really interesting because Republican Herschel Walker, his personal life has been under heavy scrutiny throughout this campaign, right? There was that allegation that he paid for and encouraged the mother of one of his children to have an abortion, a claim that he adamantly denies. There have also been accusations of past domestic abuse. He has admitted to having violent tendencies in the past, but says that was due to his mental health struggles, uh, his struggles with disassociative identity disorder. He says he's not receiving treatment for that now, but he says he no longer has symptoms, and that is in his past. We have seen attack ads focused on Walker's personal controversies throughout this campaign cycle, but they have typically been from groups other than Warnock's campaign, from outside organizations. When Senator Warnock is on the campaign trail, the incumbent Democrat, he tends to focus on work that he has done in Washington, D.C. He talks a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act, things like that. He doesn't really get into the details about some of the allegations against her Walker. He will say that he believes he is a candidate who is unqualified for the United States Senate. And he says that Herschel Walker has a pattern of lies, but rarely goes beyond that. Today, that is changing. The Warnock campaign has two new ads out in this market, both of them hitting Walker for those abortion allegations. Again, claims that Walker denies and also his history of violence. Listen to some of one of those ads that's now on air. For you, Herschel Walker wants to ban abortion. There's no exception in my mind. Like I said, I believe in life. There's not a national ban on abortion right now, and I think that's a problem. But for himself? Herschel Walker paid for an abortion for his then-girlfriend. She supported her claims. So this is, as you said, an incredibly tight race. In a lot of recent polls, the two are essentially in a statistical tie. So these new campaign ads from Warnock, it is a notable shift in their campaign tactics, especially when we're less than 20 days from the election. Well, and Lindsay. Elson, talking about that, can you give us some insight on what we're seeing from both candidates on the campaign trail in these final days? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yesterday we were out on the trail with Walker's campaign. Today we will be out with Warnock's campaign. Again, Warnock on the campaign trail, he tends to focus on the work that he has done in Washington, D.C., and trying to paint his opponent as unqualified. We tend to hear uh, Herschel Walker really try to hammer into his supporters, to voters, what he sees as Warnock's close ties to President Biden. President Biden has a low approval rating in this state. You often hear Walker say, Biden and Warnock, they are one in the same. And if you're worried about inflation, if you're worried about the cost of gas, they're the ones to blame. One thing that we've started to see in the last week or so Herschel Walker talk more about is trying to attack Warnock um, for uh, 
evictions related to a low-income apartment building that the church that Warnock is a pastor at, Ebenezer Baptist, owns. Um, that uh, that housing complex, a conservative outlet, had an article about a week ago saying that residents there had been served eviction notices. Walker's campaign is really trying to aggressively focus on that. Warnock has not outright explicitly denied that, but he has called those attacks a smear uh, on his campaign by a desperate uh, candidate. Lindsay. All right, Ellison, we know you'll stay on top of it. Thanks so much. And now we turn to the Supreme Court. SCOTUS has denied a request to block the Biden administration's student loan forgiveness program. The case was rejected by Justice Amy Coney Barrett yesterday, one day after a Wisconsin taxpayers group argued forgiving loans should be passed by Congress. Earlier this week, the Biden administration began accepting applications from borrowers who can have as much as $20,000 in federal loans forgiven. And former Trump advisor Steve Bannon is scheduled to be sentenced today for his contempt of Congress conviction. It comes exactly one year after the House held him in contempt for failing to comply with a subpoena from the January 6th committee. Bannon faces a mandatory minimum prison sentence of 30 days and up to two years behind bars, though the Justice Department is recommending six months in prison and a $200,000 fine. We have team coverage of today's sentencing with NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delanian and NBC News Legal Analyst Danny Savalas. Good morning to both of you. All right, so Ken, we're going to start with you here. Uh, Bannon's lawyers are arguing he should only get probation. So what's their argument and how likely is it that he'll avoid jail time? Good morning, Lindsay. It's not likely at all, since, as you said, the law requires uh, at least 30 days in jail on this charge. Bannon's lawyers are arguing that that part of the law is unconstitutional. They're also arguing that the prosecution was selective uh, and political arguments they made and were rejected uh, during the trial. So it's very likely, almost certain, that Bannon will be uh, will receive some term of incarceration. Uh, his lawyers also, though, have asked that if he is sentenced to jail, that that be, sentence be served in a halfway house. It would, of course, be up to the Bureau of Prisons to decide where Bannon goes. And look, the prosecutors have really asked the judge to throw the book at Bannon. They asked for the maximum under U.S. sentencing guidelines, six months in prison and a $200,000 fine. And the fine, they went to the max on the fine because they said that Steve Bannon refused to turn over any financial information in the pre-sentencing investigation as required. He just said, no thanks, you can find me the maximum and I'll pay it. And so the prosecution said, okay, judge, let's give him the max. And Danny, I want to bring you in here also because we know Bannon's lawyers are also asking that he remain free until they appeal the sentence. So how soon could we see this appeal and why this approach? This is exactly what I would expect in Bannon's case. You can ask the court to stay a sentence, but there are very strict guidelines for that. And Bannon may meet those. Number one, he's going to have a very short sentence compared to what federal sentences normally are. And second, he has a real issue for appeal. And that's not just me saying that. That's from the trial transcript of the judge in his case expressing doubt that the case law that required him to dismiss the advice of attorney defense uh, was still good law. So if even the trial judge is in doubt about the law that he had to exclude the whole advice of attorney defense, he probably has a shot on appeal, at least a decent shot. And that's one of the standards for staying your sentence. The idea is that if you sentence someone to like two months mm. and then later on that sentence is that conviction's overturned, well, there, you can't fix anything. He's already served his sentence. So that's why that law exists. I've used it myself, not with much success, but Bannon is one of those defendants that might actually prevail and be able to stay out pending appeal. Mm. Danny, when we talk about what prosecutors are saying about this, they filed this 24-page sentencing memo, and they said that Bannon's refusal to comply with the subpoena is sustained bad faith contempt of Congress. So if it's so blistering, why only push for the six months? Because they're trying to at least be reasonable. The government needs to be reasonable in asking for sentencing. And keep in mind, we have to report the statutory maximum sentence because it's the only knowable number as you go into sentencing. But the reality is Bannon is not a prior convicted felon. He's going to be on the low end of the guidelines. He's well into his 60s. The data shows that people that age are very unlikely to recidivate. In other words, do bad things again, commit future crimes. So right off the bat, Bannon is going to be on the low end of the sentencing guidelines. So the government here is being reasonable. Now, I'm a jaded defense attorney. Sometimes I feel like the government is not reasonable. But in this case, they're not trying to necessarily max him out. Uh, and that would also require consecutive sentencing 
I mean, it's just not appropriate for this situation. I do think that if Bannon's argument is successful, that the statute does not require at least a month mandatory minimum, that he could get probation. By the way, the argument that he's making for this is that in the statute, it says that this crime is punishable by essentially a minimum of one month. And he's arguing that punishable doesn't mean that the court has to. It means it's punishable, not yeah, required to be punished. Doesn't have to happen. Punishable, right. Yeah, that's the theory. We'll see if it works. Okay, well, we know you'll both keep us posted. Ken Delaney and Danny Savalos, thank you so much. A New York civil jury has cleared Kevin Spacey in his sexual abuse trial brought on by actor Anthony Rapp. Spacey left court yesterday without making any comments after the verdict was read. The jury deliberated for just over an hour, ultimately deciding Spacey was not liable in a civil sexual assault and battery case dating back to the 1980s. Rapp first made the allegations during the early days of the Me Too movement, claiming Spacey forced himself on him at a party in New York when Rapp was just 14 years old. Spacey denied the allegations. The trial lasted three weeks. Rapp has been, had been seeking rather $40 million in damages. Spacey still faces charges for a different sexual assault case in the United Kingdom. He has pleaded not guilty and is expected to go on trial there in June. And now to the latest on the war in Ukraine, where ordinary people are now living under nuclear threat. It's hard to imagine, but children are doing drills at school, so they're prepared in the event Russia resorts to nuclear warfare. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry has the story. A lesson no child should have to learn, how to survive a nuclear explosion. The teacher tries to make it a game for these eight and nine-year-olds, and Adam was walking with an Adam, she says. The two became friends as the children act out the parts. And while the fight at the front may require bulletproof vests, here at home, swim caps and goggles will have to do. A quick dash outside and down to the bunker they go. I ask nine-year-old Maxim for a quick explanation on what's happening. You have to be very careful, Maxim tells me, and pay attention to the air alarm and run to the shelter. We also have the rule of two walls, so that there's no windows, so the debris from the windows will not fall on us, he tells me. This war does not just affect the children, though these kids put on a tough face and tell me they're not scared. Is this, is it scary? So, so. Little bit. The teachers, the parents, they see it differently. They want to be brave. They want to show that they are brave, courageous. But they are scared. Everybody's scared. Tatiana Lasana is picking up her six-year-old son. And like so many here, she's already lived the unthinkable. When your son is asking me, Mom, why are they shooting to us? I don't want to die. And we're sitting in a shelter, and he's looking at me and saying that I don't want to die. I want to live. Believe me, that's, that's incredibly hard to... Um, to stay calm. A quick swing past the schoolyard, and I ask young Vika to play reporter. Go ahead. There is a war here, she reports in a serious manner. Our armed forces will make sure that everything ends, she says. Cal Perry, NBC News, Key. Now let's get a check at your weather this morning with some parts of the country seeing powerful storms. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us this morning. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning to you both. Happy Friday. And yeah, we're seeing a storm system moving into the northwest. That's going to be our next country's uh, weather makers. We head throughout the weekend into early next week. The northwest is first. And we're going to see that strong cold front moving inland today. So we're going to see the rain picking up. It's going to be widespread. Also some mountain snow. We could see up to a foot of snow in the highest elevations of the mountain. So that cold front will move to the south and east as it goes throughout tomorrow. It's going to plummet temperatures to 30 degrees compared to just a day or two ago. Two ago. And more rain and snow from Washington to Colorado over to Montana into Wyoming as well. We could see some rain also in northern California and northern Nevada. This is your snowfall forecast throughout the northwest and the Intermountain West. We're looking at anywhere from three to six inches in the lower elevation, but could see up to eight inches, even a foot in the highest elevations of the mountain ranges there. And in the lower elevations, we're seeing some rainfall. 
So where you see the uh, brighter colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, especially along the coast of Washington and Oregon into the Intermountain West, we are looking at anywhere from one to even three inches of rain. That could cause some quick flooding in some of the burn areas there. Now, speaking of burn areas and also fire danger, out ahead of this front, it is warm, it is dry, and it is windy. So we're looking at fire danger today, 14 million people impacted. Where you see the red, that is a red flag warning. So that includes portions of the Intermountain West into the central and southern plains. And that's what we're going to be watching very closely as we head throughout the day. Some of that, in, especially in Wyoming, at critical fire risk levels. Otherwise, it's really warm in the middle of the country. We're looking at temperatures in the 80s. 86 in Oklahoma City, 89 in Dallas today, 86 in San Antonio. Uh, we were so chilly there a couple days ago. We've really warmed up. We're going to keep it warm as we head throughout the weekend. So weekend warm-up temperatures into the 80s today, 86, 84 degrees in Kansas City, 75 in Waterloo. That's 15 degrees above normal for this time of year. And you guys, this will head to the east as we head throughout the weekend. So really beautiful weekend to start out in portions of the northeast. Back to you. Like the sound of a beautiful weekend, Michelle Grossman. Thank you. Sure. And coming up, more on the war in Ukraine and the growing support for the country on the baseball diamond. How America's pastime is bringing a moment of peace for some Ukrainians. You're watching Morning News Now. We are back with a story that's causing concern, especially among families with young children. A potentially serious respiratory virus known as RSV is quickly spreading across the country. It frequently infects children under two, and doctors say cases are appearing earlier in the season and more rapidly than usual. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez is in Connecticut, one of the states hit pretty hard by the virus. Parents of young children are used to respiratory illnesses, but doctors and nurses we've spoken with say they've never seen this many cases this early. Inside Connecticut Children's Hospital in Hartford, doctors and nurses are sounding the alarm. They're seeing an unprecedented number of children with respiratory illnesses. They have not seen uh, this level of, of very quick increase in the number of cases with RSV, and certainly we have never seen it in, uh, in this time period. The hospital's in touch with FEMA and the National Guard about putting up a medical tent in its parking lot as it tries to keep up. Respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, usually causes mild cold-like symptoms. There's no vaccine for it. Infants and older adults may develop severe infections from RSV, like pneumonia, because their lungs are weakened. Over the last month, 32 states have reported an increase in RSV cases. In San Diego, 50 patients have tested positive for RSV over the last few days at Rady Children's Hospital, where the chief medical officer says it's unheard of, two to three times what they've ever experienced. In Richmond, Virginia, Haley Mitchell's 13-month-old son was hospitalized. That was mine and his first time being in a helicopter, and of course it was very scary. Um, the EMTs in the back told me that there was a couple times they had to give him oxygen while we were flying. Back in Connecticut at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. Have you ever seen numbers like this before? We have not seen numbers to this degree this early. RSV cases in the emergency department have nearly doubled over the past week. Right now, every bed in this pediatric ICU is full, 90% of them with respiratory illnesses. Most kids get an RSV infection by age two, but it can happen at any age. Health officials say the spread of respiratory viruses like RSV can be prevented through hand washing, staying home when sick, and wearing a mask if you have any symptoms. Typically, RSV peaks in February, but this season, all bets are off. It's so unpredictable at this point. We're not really sure when it's going to peak and when it may come to an end. Doctors believe that one of the reasons for this surge may be that young children weren't exposed to many other viruses during the last several years of COVID. And so it's hitting all their immune systems at once. Back to you. Gabe, thanks so much. And Ukraine's national baseball team recently traveled to New York City for a series of charity games aimed at raising money to rebuild sports complexes affected by the war. And as NBC News anchor Tom Yamas found out, the games attracted an outpouring of support. Under the lights of Coney Island, where the minor league Brooklyn Cyclones usually play, a new baseball champ. Let's go, Ukraine! The 
fans dressed in blue and yellow and waving Ukrainian flags. For Ukraine, it's not a typical game to, to play baseball. Actually, I was surprised that we even have a team. <laughs> baseball may be America's national pastime, but for these Ukrainian sluggers and pitchers, a chance to meet New Yorkers on their home turf, the ballpark. To see a lot of Americans coming to us, like uh, just asking, like, hi guys, what are you, what are you doing here? How are you? Uh, how's your families? Like to know that uh, people even s as far away from Ukraine care about us. Uh, it's it's awesome. This charity event, a friendly game with members of the NYPD raising money to rebuild Ukrainian sports complexes destroyed in the war. The Ukrainian players you see here, all amateurs, here to keep support for Ukraine strong while fundraising. We want to bring even more attention to Ukraine baseball, to Ukraine country, to the war in Ukraine. For these Ukrainian players, signs of war and their families back home never far away. During our interview with a player, an air raid alert sounding on his phone. Oh, it's uh, alarming in my country. It's not easy because all my family, my sister, my mom, dad, uh, they stay in Ukraine. This away game and the chance to play baseball again, a reminder of what their country is fighting for and hopes to get back. It's some breeze of uh, normal life. Uh, when you play baseball, for example, when we are here, we just realize that for sure war gonna end. At some time we gonna win, we sure in this, and then we have the normal life. Our thanks to Tom Yamas for that report. All right, coming up, if you came back from your summer vacation covered in mosquito bites, we have some new research you'll want to hear about. <laughs> That's right. Scientists think they have found the reason some of us are tastier to the insects. We'll explain what it is. Plus, Times Square, typically full of pretty interesting characters. Well, now you can add Abe Lincoln to that list. Why people are dressing up as the 16th president in the middle of New York City. Next. back with a question that plagues a lot of minds during the summer. Why do mosquitoes bite some people more than others? Well, the new study has some pretty biting results. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has details. Nasty, pesky, blood-sucking mosquitoes. Is it true? Are some people bitten more? It's true. Everybody asks. After a three-year study, the scientists at Rockefeller University have discovered one of the reasons why. Long-chain carboxylic acids. Carboxylic Carbo acid. what? <laughs> carboxylic acids, which is a fancy technical term for these greasy molecules that live on your skin. Bacteria eat those acids and create a stink. Limburger cheese, you know, stinky cheese, blue cheese, feet, foot odor. That's the smell? That's the smell. And some of us smell more than others. The standout during the study was subject 33. We found this exceptionally mosquito attractive person. Scientist Maria Elena Deobaldia led the research. Nylons worn by the subjects were placed in a device she built herself. The mosquitoes were drawn to the strongest smell. When you put them head to head, it's striking. The hope is that these results will improve repellents. In New York, mosquitoes are an annoyance, but in much of the world, they're spreading deadly diseases. Like yellow fever and malaria, killing more than 700,000 people a year. Better repellent will save lives. For now, here's some summer barbecue advice. If you hang around with people who are less attractive than you, you'll be the most attractive person at the picnic. What we really need to do is find somebody who stinks more than we do. Absolutely. For those unlucky people like Subject 33, the scientists say changing soaps or your diet makes no difference. The mosquitoes will find you. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. They'll find us. The mosquitoes will find you, so watch out. Thank you, Stephanie. And now we turn to politics. It's no secret that there are deep cultural and political divides in America today, and they often seem to ramp up right around election time. And politics can damage relationships among coworkers, family members, friends. And as we enter the final days before the midterms, one group is trying to bridge the gap, and they're calling on a familiar face to help. The nonprofit organization starts with us and 
87 Abraham Lincolns. All right, yep, people dressed up as Honest Abe took over Times Square yesterday to send a message. We shouldn't get caught up in the divisiveness that comes with election season. So here to talk about that is Tom Fishman, the CEO of Starts With Us. Thank you so much for being here. So I want to give us a stat that's important to your organization. It shows that 87% of Americans are tired of the divisiveness we spoke about earlier. And it sounds like that has to do with the 87 Abe Lincolns we heard about. So why make Abe the face of this campaign? What's the story? Uh, so Abraham Lincoln is an icon of preserving our union. He saw America through one of our most dangerous uh, us versus them times. So we know that we wanted to use uh, an, uh, an image and somebody that would resonate uh, with the American people. So we chose Abe to represent uh, 87 Abes to represent the 87 percent of people who are sick and tired of the divisions that are tearing our communities apart every day. Mm. We all probably have had that experience where things get a little uncomfortable with somebody. Um, but we know also, for example, Thanksgiving's coming up. A lot of people are going to be thinking about this as they get ready to see some people they haven't seen in a while at the dinner table. How is your organization working to remedy the, the divides right now? And also, what can the average person do? Yeah, so we're trying to use media, storytelling, and technology to provide the tools uh, and the skills to people at scale to have those tough conversations. So we work with everyone from uh, the Greater Good Science Center and the Center for Constructive Dialogue to understand the deepest and most evidence-backed science um, for how to communicate with nuance, for how to have tough conversations across lines of difference. And we, we turn those tips uh, into really interesting uh, and hopefully entertaining uh, media format. So, so everything what from are some things TikToks. that people can do that you that you're learning about? Right. So one thing is to go into tough conversations uh, with intentionality. So one of the things we encourage people to do is to think about what the goal is of a conversation. If you're going to reunite with a family member who you have a fundamental disagree with, go into that with intention. Write down ahead of time. What do I have in common with this person? Center yourself around the things that you do share, including your familial relationship, and know that you may not change their mind. The goal is not to change everybody's mind. The goal is to stay at that Thanksgiving table together, uh, have a civil and uh, uh, co connective conversation across those lines of difference, and even if you disagree, maintain each, uh, the humanity and the connection across that line of difference. I like that, civil, connected, and maintain the humanity. And I was glad to hear you talk about media and technology because yeah. it's no secret social media has been a big factor when it comes to the divisiveness and I know your group is actually using it to do the opposite through a money talks filter so can you tell us about that that's right so we tried to bring Abe to life uh, for the masses so we worked with a preeminent uh, uh, augmented reality camera effect creator uh, Karen X Chang to bring Abraham Lincoln to life on the five dollar bill so if you use Instagram's uh, the the money talks filter on Instagram you can hover over Abe's face or a picture of Abe's face on the five dollar bill He'll come to life and bring uh, bring to life that message so many of us ne need to hear uh, ahead of the midterms, which is it starts with us to make the vibes less extreme. Oh, I like that. To make the vibes less extreme. Tom right. Fishman, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks. Coming up, taking matters into her own hands. A physicist who's on a mission to educate the world about women and minority scientists using a resource many folks use every day, Wikipedia. She joins us next with the inspiration behind her project. Now to a story we first told you about earlier this week. A British physicist is on a mission to educate the world about women and minorities who've made major contributions to science. That's right. Dr. Jess Wade noticed Wikipedia had very few entries on women and minority scientists, so she's taken matters into her own hands, writing her own entries to make sure they're never forgotten. Well, Dr. Jess Wade joins us now. Thank you for being here. So first off, this is just so cool. Your name and story have been absolutely <laughs> everywhere this week, so congrats on that and for good reason because you have written more than 1600 wikipedia entries for unknown women scientists so why was this so important to you and what was your process because it's a lot of time i imagine yeah, but I mean, a really awesome time. You know, I get to tell these stories of these incredible pioneers and people who've made these huge breakthroughs and contributions to our understanding of the world. So, so what kind of motivated me was really that we do need to give credit to people who've done absolutely phenomenal things, but also this potential to inspire a new generation of scientists and engineers who can use a platform like Wikipedia, look up these incredible innovators, people like Gladys West or Samita Mitra or Kizzy Corbett, find out their story and hopefully one day become scientists too. So we do the part of honoring, but we also do that part of inspiring when we use storytellings and encyclopedias like Wikipedia to document those incredible discoveries.
you think about something like this and you think, who could be against this? Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, there are actually people, editors, anonymous editors working for Wikipedia who have flagged for deletion some of your articles because they didn't think these people were noteworthy enough for a global audience. What was your reaction to that and why do you think you've gotten pushback? I mean, people always push you back when you're trying to do something different, right? It kind of implies that you're doing the right thing, I think, when you antagonize trolls on the internet. Internet. But I would say that we all, as a society, need to do more to celebrate and honor these incredible pioneers, whether they're women, people of color, people from LGBTQ+, or other historically marginalized communities. We all need to do that part to uplift them, to document their story, to give them awards, to induct them into prestigious societies so that it's easier to prove their notability in textbooks or on websites like Wikipedia. So it's kind of this cycle, right? I need people to be honored and mentioned in kind of contemporary mainstream media and platforms to cite them on Wikipedia or in a textbook. But if we're not doing that part to make sure that African-American women mathematicians get honored, then it's really hard to write about them. So I see my role not only as documenting these stories, but also trying to get those people their recognition offline as well. So that it's easier to celebrate online. And Dr. Wade, as you talk, I'm reminded it's not just about the history that you're chronicling, but also the future. Because when we look at stats around STEM, according to the American Association of University Women, women actually just make up 28% of the U.S. workforce in science and tech and engineering and math. And only one in five current engineering or computer science majors are actually women. So how can we not only increase the numbers of women and minorities working in these fields, but also retain them? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. And so certainly there have been some really amazing collectives coming together across America in the last few years. Things like 500 Women Scientists, Black in Engineering, Black in Physics kind of networks, which really provide opportunities, people with the opportunities to grow professionally and also to make those links that you really need as a scientist. But what we really need is to sit down and give people career advice, to mentor them, to give them help writing their resumes, to give people the opportunity to expand their labs, to buy equipment, and to really give scholars from historically marginalized groups the space to grow so we can see their potential, so we can work out whether we can take on issues like climate change or antibiotic resistance or the ongoing pandemic. You know, we need scientists from all different backgrounds to be contributing to that. And that means giving them appropriate money, space and resources to be able to do it. So I think there are so many organizations across America working on it now, and we just need everyone else's support to make this happen. Well, Dr. Jess Wade, we know you're a big part of that. So thank you so much for your work and for being with us. Thank you for having me. And turning now to your wallet, new inflation data out yesterday suggests the nation's housing market is cooling off and it's got some economists predicting a real estate recession on the horizon. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has the latest numbers. From the for sale sign in front yards nationwide, further evidence that red hot inflation may be putting a chill over the economy. Home sales in September fell to a 10 year low, down nearly 24% from a year ago. A fast slowdown with the Federal Reserve aggressively hiking rates to combat runaway inflation. A new loan on a 30 year mortgage now averages nearly 7.4%, a 22 year high, and more than double where rates were a year ago pricing many families out of their dream homes. In Arkansas, single mom Valerie Williams just bought her first home, but the higher mortgage rate is cutting into the family budget. It was a major adjustment from what I originally wanted and could afford to what I had to get just to make ends meet and still have a roof over my head. Higher rates are also blamed for cooling new home construction, down 8.1% from a year ago. Despite the slowdown in buying, there are fewer homes on the market. The tight supply has kept prices up. The average home now selling for nearly $385,000 in September. We're definitely in a housing recession. There's tons of headwind, but there's also a tremendous amount of pinup demand. And the Federal Reserve isn't done yet. It's expected to hike rates another three quarters of a point in November and at least another half point in December. Higher rates and the slowdown have more CEOs warning that the new year could bring more economic pain. Tom, thanks so much. And turning now to more financial news and a report that Twitter might see job cuts in the coming months. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us now with more on this and other financial headlines. Good morning, Silvana.
Good morning to you, Will. Yeah, Twitter is telling employees there are no plans for company-wide layoffs since it signed a deal to be bought by Elon Musk. That's according to Reuters. Now, the Washington Post is reporting Musk told prospective investors in the deal he plans to get rid of nearly 75 percent of Twitter's 7,500 workers. The Post says the cuts are expected in the coming months, no matter who owns the company, as current management plans to trim payroll by about $800 million. Snapchat's parent company is blaming inflation for the slowest sales growth since it went public five years ago. Snap is the first major social media company to report third quarter results and shares are tumbling in extended trading. Snap warning it expects no sales growth during the typically busy holiday season. Meanwhile, shares of Meta, Google's parent, Alphabet and Pinterest are falling as well. In August, Snap announced it would cut 20 percent of its workforce and scrap projects such as ga- such as a gaming and a camera drone to cut costs. And American Airlines is getting rid of first-class seats on its international flights. The move puts American in line with rivals Delta and United, who dumped those seats several years ago. American says it will expand business class, with some sections being called flagship suites. They feature seats that convert into beds and have doors for privacy. American says the simple reason for the change is that customers aren't buying first-class tickets. What do you guys think? They're expensive. That's They're what I expensive, think. Right? Exactly. <laughs> I agree. That's the candid answer. Silvana, thank you so much. You got it. All right, coming up, there's something mysterious in the skies that may make you want to believe. We're going to show you what's behind the new images of unidentified aerial phenomena recently captured by airline pilots. And- Welcome back. Now for something you might just have seen on your social media feeds this morning. Overnight, Taylor Swift dropped her 10th studio album. The 13-song collection is called Midnights. Critics are praising it for its folksy and honest music, with the Metacritic aggregator site giving it a 94 out of 100. As for the name of the album, Swift has previously described it as stories of 13 sleepless nights scattered throughout my life. So Mm -hmm. a lot of... um, what are they called? Easter eggs in clay? Yes. Like little clues sprinkled throughout? She loves 13. And also we have to give a shout out to Savannah, who is the ultimate Swifty. So <laughs> it's it's why she's off, right? It's like a national holiday. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Lindy, thank you. And now to those mysterious and possibly otherworldly sightings that have been spotted across the globe. Recent videos reportedly captured by commercial airline pilots appear to show unidentified aerial phenomena or UAPs flying over the U.S. and off its coastline. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz joins us now with more spacey news. Gotti? Hey, Zinkley, yeah, we just talked to a pilot, and before we tell you his story, you should know, this guy is a former fighter pilot, helicopter pilot, he, he's a jet flight fi, uh, fighter instructor, he's got several degrees in things like meteorology, and before all this, he never really took UFOs seriously, but that all changed this month when he saw these lights that appeared out of what uh, seemed to be the Big Dipper started flying in these really strange patterns, all while tracking his plane. Over the last several months, there's something unexplainable appearing in the night, from the skies over Missouri to above the Pacific Ocean. It's not a satellite, it's not a meteor. All baffling pilots mid-flight. I don't know what the uh, common denominator is, but it's always at the bottom of the Big Dipper. Mark Holsey is a former F-18 fighter pilot. This August, he was piloting a private jet off the coast of Los Angeles when he says he saw as many as seven mysterious objects appearing to fly thousands of feet above him. This is audio from that night alerting air traffic control. Yeah, I don't know. You're not entering any military or space or anything. I'm not sure. The clip obtained by Ben Hansen, a researcher who has spoken to dozens of pilots of commercial flights that have recently had similar encounters. So it seems like it might be getting more frequent? It's either getting more frequent or it's getting noticed more. Okay, there it is. But while no one seems to know what they're seeing, Holsey is sure these fast orbiting objects aren't satellites or any known military aircraft. There's nothing that flies that high. So the odds of it being a military aircraft doing high G loads like that, it's just it's impossible. It's completely impossible. Does this phenomenon seem to be under intelligent control? That's the only thing it could be. I mean, it's either artificial or or biological. It all comes on the heels of a congressional hearing earlier this year where intelligence officials testified for the first time ever that there were about 400 new sightings of unidentifiable objects, adding UAP reports are frequent and continuing. Uh, No, I do not. 
And this latest wave of sightings from pilots could be just the beginning. I bet my life on it. There are many more pilots and a lot more videos that are going to come out. I know this is going to happen. I know it is. Okay, Zinkley, well, that Pentagon report is expected to be given to Congress by the end of the month. It could either provide an explanation for uh, the increasing number of sightings or at the very least reveal some new information about uh, more encounters. The question is, how much is, is going to actually be declassified? Zinkley? Hmm, so interesting. And, Gotti, I wonder, do we know if this has gotten the attention of the Pentagon and UAP task force in Washington? Yeah, so Mark, the pilot you just heard from, says that he was told his report would be included in that review for Congress. And based on other pilots he's been talking to, he is convinced that dozens of commercial pilots are going to be coming forward describing the exact same types of lights flying in this uh, weird racetrack-like pattern, all in the direction of the Big Dipper. So we'll see. Time will tell. Gotti, thank you. Yes. And that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.